Hello, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and I would like to like you to join me today for the basics of Geiger counters and radiation. Today's topic are the basics of Geiger counters. This video is intended for people who are not very familiar with a Geiger counter, perhaps have a very limited scientific background. Let's say you've heard of an atom, you've heard of a proton, you've heard of a neutron, you don't really need to know much about them. You don't need to have any special math skills. You don't even need to own a Geiger counter. But if you are interested in buying a Geiger counter, or if you're just interested in what radiation is and all this Fukushima business and things you keep hearing about, this following series of videos may be for you. I am painstakingly setting up all, all these videos and shooting them over the course of a several day, perhaps two week period. I will deal with simple topics such as the basic usage of a Geiger counter all the way up to some complex advanced topics including uh, mathematics, the geometry of Geiger counters, and the mathematics of radiation. But that will be later parts, not the one you're currently looking at. Today we will just cover the basics of the Geiger counter. Please join me. The Geiger counter was developed by Hans Geiger and Ernest Rutherford in 1908. It is a particle detector. Its job is to detect ionizing particle radiation. I will go in detail in a little bit into what ionizing particle radiation is, and in later subsequent videos I will explain the different characteristics of each type of radiation, as well as the fact that some of them behave a little bit more like waves than they do like particles. Generally speaking, there are four fundamental types of radiation that a Geiger counter can detect. Originally, the Geiger counter could detect alpha radiation only. In 1928, Walter Mueller was able to augment the way the Geiger counter worked such that it could detect other forms of radiation, beta, gamma, and x-ray as well. That is why the tube that is inside of a Geiger counter that allows it to detect radiation is often referred to as a Geiger-Mueller tube. Let me give you a basic idea of how that works. But first, let's detect some radiation. Most Geiger counters have an internal speaker to let you hear a pulse of sound for every single incidence of radiation that crosses the Geiger tube. In other words, every time it detects it. Think of like a metal detector. This one has an internal sounder, but I'm going to hook up an external sounder. The reason for the external sounder is it makes a louder sound. Let us plug that in. And now let's turn it on. The ticking sounds you may now hear are from radiation as it passes through the Geiger-Muller tube. There's not very much radiation around us. There we go. So you're not going to hear very much. But if we were to introduce radiation, you would hear more. Let us move this out of the way, and I will draw for you how a Geiger tube works. While this is over here, you probably will be able to hear it some. Let me pull my pin out here. The basic Geiger tube works in the following way. Let me draw this thick so you can see. You have usually a cylindrical tube, although there are other configurations that exist. This tube is full of a low pressure gas that is well, sometimes called noble, sometimes called inert. But these are the gases if you, that you will find on a periodic table of elements generally on the far right, such as argon or neon and whatnot. Down the center of this tube is a wire, an electrode if you like. This electrode is positively charged, and in this case it is called an anode. The outside of the tube is usually either coated in metal or metal itself, and it is negatively charged and it is called a cathode. A lot of voltage is applied to the anode, a very large voltage. And uh, actually, excuse me, the anode and the cathode. And the result is a huge potential between the two. 
a lot of electrical potential, meaning electricity wishes to flow between them, but it cannot do so because the gas itself is not going to in innately conduct that energy. It needs to be assisted with this. There's no current flowing. When radioactive particles enter the tube, when they fly through the tube, here's your radioactive particle flying through the tube, they excite the atoms that are inside of the tube, and I will go into this in much more detail in subsequent videos, including the math behind this, but not for this video. Suffice it to say, the atoms become excited, they release electrons, and the atom that has released an electron becomes an ion. It is not correctly charged anymore. It is more positively charged by far than, than negatively charged. The electrons will flow directly to the cath uh, excuse me to the anode, which is right here in the middle. The electrons will flow to the anode, a pulse of them. The ions, the positively charged remainder of the atom, will flow to the cathode, which is right here, where it will pick up enough electrical enough electrons to become stable and normal again. The act of the Geiger counter becoming normal and calm again and, and releasing its excited state is called Geiger quenching, which we'll go into in much more depth later on, but for right now you need to ne merely know the basics. These electrons, as they move along, and these ion, uh, ions, as they move along, interfere with other atoms, causing them to gain or lose electrons, causing them to become ions and, electro and, and release electrons as well. And it works like a chain reaction, as, as though you hit a, a, a single domino and it sets off other dominoes. They grow until an entire wave of them moves across the Geiger tube and quenches into the Geiger tube, creating an electrical pulse. That electrical pulse is heard on the speaker. That is what you're hearing. The tube then self-quenches, which we'll go into in another video, what halogen self-quench tubes are, but basically the tube calms down and relaxes and it prepares itself for the next piece of radiation to come into it. This is how a Geiger tube works. Geiger counters come in various shapes and sizes these days. They are long removed from the Geiger counters of old. Many are familiar with the big yellow box with a handle that, uh, that pops off and detects radiation. A wand, sometimes referred to as a pickle probe. These are the old civil defense Geiger counters. They are famously the CDV 700 and its counterparts. Modern day Geiger counters have replaced most of these older Geiger counters with small digital Geiger counters which are easy to read, providing numbers for people to read on the dials as opposed to just a simple analog dial itself. But most importantly, the, many of the newer ones feature something called a thin window. This is a thin window. It is, it is basically a little tiny part of the Geiger tube that is thinner than the rest of the Geiger tube. It has a piece of mica over the end of it. Let me show you what mica looks like. This is mica, the real substance. Mica is generally visible through light. You can see light on the other side of mica. But mica allows most of the radiation to get into the Geiger counter, but at the same time, it does not let the gas get out of the, mica, out of the Geiger counter. The mica makes this Geiger counter a little bit more easy to damage as this this fragile mica window must be kept clear of debris at all times, water must not get to it, or heavy humidity, and it must not be, be poked. However, it allows the detection of the very, very uh, weak alpha particles. Geiger counters come in various shapes and sizes as well. This is just standard Geiger counter. Here is a pancake Geiger counter. Let me show you why it's called a pancake. If you pull the safety cap off, which is also serves a secondary role, but I can tell you about that later, you will see a large pancake Geiger Mueller tube. I would like you to compare this 
to the smaller but very similar pancake, or excuse me, thin window. It's a mica window. Do you see the size difference? This little Geiger counter will pick up significantly more than the other. Let me put this here and let me turn on this Geiger counter and let's see what the difference is. Alright. It can take the Geiger counter a full minute to get a statistical average of what it's reading. So its numbers can read pretty high for a little while. But forgetting what the numbers read on the front of the Geiger counter, the, various, the actual frequency of the ticking itself is telling you something. As you can see, the pancake picks up a lot more radiation. This radiation that you're detecting is perfectly normal. It is called background radiation and it comes from space. It's very similar to the light from the sun in its own way. It rains down upon us all of the time. Did you hear that beeping sound? That was telling me that this has reached enough counts to be statistically accurate at what it's showing me. It is showing me an approximation of what the number of counts in one minute would be if it had continued at its current rate over the, uh, over the last couple of seconds. Consider the analogy of a lemonade stand. If you sold lemonade at a lemonade stand and then every single every single hour you wanted to know how much lemonade you had sold, you could wait for that full hour and know. But if you didn't want to wait, you could calculate how much lemonade you've sold in 10 minutes. You could multiply that by 6 because there are 6 sets of 10 minutes in 1 hour and you could get a good rough approximation. If you sold 10, 10 lemonades in 6 in and in, in six, uh, excuse me, in ten minutes, then you could assume that you might sell sixty in in sixty minutes or one hour. But it is an approximation. Then the very next set of uh, of ten minutes could have thirty lemonades sold, and so your estimate would have to go up a little bit. This is what this is. It's a running estimation of the number of counts that this unit will detect, and a count is a tick in a one minute period. This reading is in counts per minute. The reason that we use counts per minute is because we don't know the energy of the radiation being emitted. Various radiations have various levels of energy, and it's really the energy that makes the difference. If a five-year-old child punched you very, very hard in the stomach, it may not hurt very much. But if a 45-year-old uh, man punched you in the stomach, it might hurt significantly more. So it's not accurate to say that each punch is equal to one another, is it? But you can at least count them and still know with some degree of certainty that that at least is the right number of counts. By analogy, a high energy gamma source may, if it does interact with your body, produce more damage than a lower gamma energy source, depending on the conditions. This is merely counting the type, of, the amount of radiation, not the type or the energy of the radiation. It, this is the most proper way to count radiation unless you know exactly what you're doing and you know exactly what the source is that you're detecting. To give you an idea, let us flip to one of the more exotic types of units that you can use. Miller-Rankins, which is a little lowercase m with an uppercase r. These are now both in Miller-Rankins per hour. Given time, they will probably end up being very similar readings to one another. And the reason is because this unit was, when it was calibrated originally, they took into account that it actually produces, that it actually detects more, and they factored that in as they were making the calculations. Meaning that generally these numbers are going to be pretty close to one another. They're a little bit off right now by about double, but they will calm down and relax in a few minutes and be very close to one another. This is an inappropriate measurement for measuring radiation. So are microsieverts, which are usually denoted by a small u with a capital S and a lowercase v. Microsieverts also, just like Millerankins, are a measure of the amount of energy as it affects a human being. But because we do not know the type of energy we're being exposed to right now, nor can we correctly guess, we cannot correctly use a metric that tells us about energy. If that makes, makes sense to you, then you understand why to use counts per minute. 
If it does not and seems a little bit complex and you're not sure, then just understand from a professional standpoint it is correct and proper to use counts per minute at all times unless you know what you're doing. Now, let's talk about what to do with your Geiger counter when you first get it. Tip. For your Geiger counter, the little ticking sound is fun. In fact, many people like Geiger counters for the ticking sound. Perhaps the analogy is a motorcycle that makes a loud noise and people buy special mufflers to make the loud noise, which also does help their efficiency as well. I, can, I, I, I would ask you to consider buying an external sounder, an external speaker if you like. It makes a better sound and makes your Geiger counter more enjoyable. Let me plug the external sounder up so that you can hear the difference. We plug it in, we cut off the, ex the normal sound, we leave the Geiger counter on, and then we turn on the external sounder. It sounds a little nicer, I think, and really gives you a good feel. Although I should probably get a better one for myself. So you've just gotten your new Geiger counters in the mail. Here they are. What do you do first? Let's pull our Geiger counters out. And as you can see, I've crudely wrapped my own Geiger counters back up again. They usually come in a little bit better condition than this. Here's your Geiger counter. Most Geiger counters, when they come in the mail, from most companies, come with a battery already in them. The two I have here are from two completely different companies, but they, these companies are related to one another, and these both use 9-volt batteries. First, check your Geiger counter to make sure it looks like it's in good repair. You don't see any damage, nothing seems to be broken, give it a little shake, nothing rattles. It's probably in good shape. Put it down, turn it on, all the way up. There's an on switch right here. They have different on switches, so I'm not going to cover the basic usage and, and control of this particular brand of Geiger counter. This one is, by the way, from International Medcom, and it's called a CRM100. Let's get our other Geiger counter out. Here we go. This probe unit, it's called a probe unit because it has a probe. And this probe is what's called a pancake Geiger Mueller tube. The reason it is called a pancake is, well, you saw a moment ago, it has a big wide circular tube on it as opposed to the thinner little AA sized battery looking tube that's inside of this Geiger counter. You should fire it up as well. Let me move the box out of the way. The reason you do this is you want to make sure that these are operating correctly. So what happens? You pull it out of the box, turn it on, you see readings, things are ticking, numbers are shooting all over the place. Are you safe? A lot of people panic when they first turn the Geiger counter on. Some people have bought a Geiger counter because something has gone wrong in their area. There's been a spill, the, something bad has occurred, natural disaster, and they're worried. They think they have radon, whatnot. So they turn the Geiger counter on, they see readings, they panic. Do not panic. If these readings in one minute's time do not drop below 100 or about 300, depending on how sensitive your unit is, then perhaps you might want to look around a little bit and figure out what's going on. But before you start panicking, you should take a few things into account. And I'll show you in just a moment some commonly, commonly found household radioactive items. Is your table radioactive? Is it granite? Do you have, perhaps, an old watch sitting around? Is the old watch sitting right by the Geiger counter and setting it off? It could have, uh, you could have an old radium watch. Relatively safe to have nearby you, but it could make the Geiger counter's reading shoot up into a thousand or more. So before you assume that your entire house is flooded with dangerous radiation, stop for a minute. Consider you've been living in it for months, so ten more minutes isn't going to do very much more damage to you. And walk around with your Geiger counter, feel out your environment, and see what's really there. Is it really dangerous? You'll find out soon. Most likely your readings will drop down to, this one is 11, this one is 30. Depending on where you live, this can be higher. If you live in Denver, Colorado, for example, this could be up in the 80 to 90 range. This one could be up in the 40 to 50 range. Easily. In some places it could be even less. 20, 30 counts per minute, 40 counts per minute. These things are generally common depending on your altitude and location, what's in your ground around you, and various other factors, and they're not usually a cause for major alarm. The very first thing to do 
is to scout your area and find radioactive sources. These are things that are radioactive enough to very much excite the Geiger counter, not weekly where you have to very carefully e examine, but they just excite the Geiger counter like crazy. It is important to find these and either get rid of them or move them out of the area because they will throw the rest of your readings off. I will demonstrate how to find some of these items now. As you go around your house, sweep your Geiger counter around objects. Common objects can be located that are more likely to be radioactive than others. For example, this rock collection. Could some of these rocks be radioactive? It would take a long time to scan for minute amounts of radiation, but very small amounts of radiation may be readily detectable. Let's see. Here the ticks will tell you. Small pulses of ticks are not indicative of very much of anything. Ignore them. Wait for a moment and see if you get more. Wait a minute. This rock continuously puts out higher readings than other rocks. And it could be radioactive. To determine the truth of this, Move the other rocks aside, test them individually. Not very much. Test the rock that's suspect. As you can see, this rock is radioactive and needs to be either repositioned or at least taken away from a place where family and friends could expose themselves to it. I am reading 112 counts per minute from it. That is above normal. Radiation can be found in many other places. For example, glassware. Glassware is a great place to find radiation. A very, very famous and commonly known form of radioactive glassware is depression glass, sometimes called canary glass, uh, Vaseline glass, or carnival glass. The simple way to determine is to inspect it with a Geiger counter. You will get ticks as you move your Geiger counter along. This is perfectly normal. This little piece of glassware is ticking a bit, but then the ticking stops. It is probably not radioactive. I'm noticing that I tend to be around the 40 to 50 range in counts per minute. I'll show you in a minute how to determine what the range should actually be. But right now we're not looking for minor radioactivity. We're looking for very blaring, very over-the-top radioactivity. Let us continue to move our wand around until we find something. I'm sure we will. When determining that something over here is radioactive, it's important to set all of the glassware pieces out on a table individually and test each one of them to see which one is the actual culprit. The reality is I know which one is the culprit, so I will show it to you. As you can see, the Geiger counter is registering hundreds of counts per minute. Does your grandmother or grandfather have glassware like this? If they do, it's probably radioactive. It is not a massive cause for concern. The radioactivity is mostly coming from a particle type called an alpha particle, which we will go into in more detail later. It is not very dangerous unless you swallow it or inhale it. Within just a few inches, it stops. However, on contact, the readings can be quite high. As beautiful as Vaseline glass is, one should be careful eating off of it. If it is kept in a room by itself, such as in this room in this glass cabinet, it is actually pretty safe. 
but keep in mind it is a source of radiation that can throw off your readings in your Geiger counter if nothing more. My Geiger counter reads nearly a thousand counts emitted off of this object. But there are other sources to be had. Tip. When to try and determine, trying to determine the type of radiation in an object, such as this Vaseline glass piece, sometimes it is a good idea to put something in between the radioactive object and what you are trying to detect it with, the Geiger counter. As an example, I know that this produces alpha radiation. If I take this, which is a piece of lead that is wrapped inside of aluminum foil to make it safe to handle, and I put it in between the glass and myself, it will stop almost all, if not all, of this radiation. Let us get the glass working. Let's put the glass like this. Now watch what happens when I put this in between. This stopped most of the radiation, which tells us that this radiation is either alpha or beta radiation. A steel plate may be used for a similar method, but it is not as good as lead. Notice that some radiation still gets through. The fact that some radiation makes it through this tells us that it is probably also emitting a small amount of gamma radiation. The plastic cap which comes with this Geiger counter and some Geiger counters itself is somewhat useful too. It has reduced some of the radiation. It gives you a clear indicator that this is either alpha or beta radiation. There may be a little bit of gamma, but very little. It is easily stopped. Many kitchen tables and bathrooms are made with granite. Granite is a beautiful substance for making kitchen tables and it should not be automatically feared. Most granite sold is not very radioactive or radioactive at all. I have personally detected hundreds and hundreds and hundreds or measured hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces and majority of them are only weakly detectable at best. Some are more so than others. Notice that I have 40 to 42 counts per minute. This is really starting to look more and more like my average in this place, but let's find out. When I put the Geiger counter over top of the granite, my readings go up to 60, 72, 82. Notice I'm slowly moving around 94, 106, 110, as you can see there's the number, 116. This is relatively normal to find off of a granite countertop. It is not radon gas, by the way. That should not be confused with radon gas. Detecting radon gas with a Geiger counter is incredibly difficult, and it is very much not the correct way to do it. So, that being said, there are so many sources of radiation in our houses. We should take these into account. When unpacking your Geiger counter and putting it on the table for the first time, if you have unpacked it and put it on a, on a granite countertop, that could explain your high readings. Also, if you're testing things that you believe to be radioactive, be careful as to where you test them. It makes a difference. Now it is important to understand how to get an ambient reading for your house, sometimes known as a baseline or a standard background count. Here's how you do it. Tip. When buying a Geiger counter, consider buying a really, really inexpensive radioactive material to test with to make sure your Geiger counter is in good working order. I recommend light salt, otherwise known as potassium chloride salt, no salt, new salt. It goes under many different uh, names. It is salt made of potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride. I have put mine in a Ziploc bag and labeled it. It is weakly radioactive, producing something called beta radiation, and it will not harm you. You can eat this. In fact, it is sold for human consumption. But, 
It allows you to tell if your Geiger counter is working. Take a look. It is a quick way to determine if your Geiger counter is working correctly. To establish a background count, take your Geiger counter and place it in an area where it is not likely to be stepped on and where it is out of the way. I am putting mine on the floor right here because I know nobody ever comes over here and anybody who does knows what's here. Consider pets. Consider plants that hang above and may drip or release um, plant, plant, uh, flowering pieces into the actual Geiger counter. Consider the area that you're in. Is there anything radioactive? But we've already tested the areas, hopefully, to make sure that nothing is, is very acutely radioactive. Place your Geiger tube in a position where it will not be damaged. For a wide pancake tube, place it on its side. This way dust will not go into the pancake tube. For this sort of Geiger counter, place it generally pointing at a wall. This is with a few inches in between. This will provide some protection should it need it. Place your Geiger counter and then perform one of two types of tests. The point of this is to sample an area for a long period of time, many hours if possible, to determine what an average count should be. To do this, most Geiger counters have a timer function. I will show you how to do it on my Geiger counters, but it will be different on each sort of Geiger counter. If you select the timer function, my Geiger counter will start to automatically counting a number that increments for every tick. It will do this continuously and inde pretty much indefinitely until it runs out of the ability to count or battery power. It is a smart idea to count with the volume off. The reason to do this is that you do not want to run out of battery power and it takes significantly more power when you're counting with sound. To do this sort of count, which is an unknown time, you take a pencil and paper or a pen and you write down the exact time on a watch. You can even leave the watch nearby to ensure the watch is not radioactive, of course. Select the timer function. In this case, it's called a total count. It's how many times it's detected radiation. Walk away. If you come back eight hours later, let's say you come back ten hours later, it doesn't matter. You'll take the number you found here. This is the number of counts in, let's say, ten hours. First off, you need to know how many minutes that is because you're trying to convert to counts per minute. Well, there are 60 minutes in an hour. So 60 minutes times 10 hours is 600 minutes. That's very simple math. If you have any troubles with the math and if it's not an exact amount of minutes or hours, use a calculator. Determine how many minutes have passed. Once you have the number of minutes, you divide the number of counts into the number of minutes. It is that simple. Let us say that in 10 hours, which is 600 counts, or 600 minutes rather, 600 minutes, in 6 hours, in 10 hours you have 600 minutes. Let us say that you receive 6,000 counts. 6,000 divided by 600 would be six counts every minute on average. For a Geiger counter like this, you'd be looking at something more on the lines of 20 to maybe 80 counts per minute because this is so much more sensitive. For this one, maybe a lower number. Where I live, I find that this Geiger counter generally gives me on average 14 counts a minute in most places, and this one generally gives me about 42 counts per minute. Average in multiple locations if you need to, around your house in various places. You can then sum all of your averages and divide them by the number that you've taken to determine the total average of your house. This is exceptionally important because if you look at your Geiger counter and it's reading 80 to 90 counts per minute, how do you know what's actually happening? Are you being exposed to some radioactive source? You won't know unless you know what your baselines and your, uh, uh, are normally. Generally, you need to know the way things are before you can know if they changed. Take into account also the data and the time. 
Most places have a nighttime average and a daytime average, and the reason for this is that when the sun is out, you're getting more radiation from the sun. When the, the sun is on the other side of the Earth, then the other side, then the Earth itself is blocking all of that solar radiation. Most of it doesn't get to you. You're still going to get background radiation, which comes from space, cosmic radiation, as well as things around you. Your nighttime averages will often be lower. So keep that in mind. You see, we have a lot of flux right now. I'm at 88 counts per, well, excuse me, I'm not at 88. I'm still timing. Pardon me. See? We're at 16 counts per minute, or 15 counts per minute. These two are very close to one another right this moment. We're not getting very much radiation at all. It is important that when you average, you continuously write these numbers down. Average every day, for the, uh, every day, several times a day if you like, for the first couple weeks that you own this to get a good idea of what everything should be in your house. And understand that some places are going to be higher than others. And understand that, that if the places are higher, such as a, a granite countertop, it is not necessarily a cause for alarm. If you're finding several hundred counts per minute, you might want to consider disposing of whatever it is that's, pro pro that's producing so much radiation. But it is not a reason to consider yourself endangered or that you will immediately develop cancer. You could get several hundred counts per minute off of a granite countertop. I would consider getting rid of the granite countertop, but I wouldn't consider it a cause for alarm. If you read thousands of counts from something in your house, thousands and thousands and thousands of counts, that is a different story. You might want to consider getting rid of that object, or even uh, speaking to your local authorities if you need to. Hello folks, I hope you've enjoyed me, Tom, on this uh, very first video that I've made about Geiger counters and how to use them, using my new camera and my new Geiger counters. I intend to finish this up with several, several more where I'm going to discuss radiation in more detail and go into a lot more detail about Geiger counters. I will start with a pre prerequisite in the beginning of each video so you know whether this is for you or not. Today has just been for fun. Let me finish off with a few closing things. First off, with your Geiger counter, on the back of my Geiger counter I have a little hatch here and inside I have a piece of paper that tells me the date the Geiger counter was placed into service as well as the calibration due date. I cannot stress enough that if you have, that you need to calibrate your Geiger counter yearly or at the latest every two years. Think of it like an oil change. If you don't calibrate your Geiger counter it can be malcalibrated, meaning that if I'm reading 100 counts per minute it may not be correct. Many times, way too many times, people pull a Geiger counter out of a closet that if they haven't used in five or six years and they cut it on. Let's say that the Fukushima event has occurred, a meltdown in Japan. You turn the Geiger counter on and you're reading a uh, thousand counts per minute outside no matter where you test it. And it is going up and down as you move it around, so it seems like it could be accurate. Are you being exposed to radiation? You don't know because your Geiger counter is not calibrated. And the, t the time that you need it the most is the time that's going to be the hardest to get it calibrated. If an emergency happens in your town, you know, somebody's done something bad, or let us say that your local nuclear power plant's had a problem, or even with Fukushima, you can't get it calibrated. Not right when things are going wrong. That's like replacing the smoke alarm battery when there's already a fire. I can't stress enough. Calibrate it every year. It's usually a hundred bucks or less. You can calibrate it yourself if you know how, but if you know how, you're probably not watching this video. I would recommend letting an experienced professional calibrate it. There are many services that are out there to do so. Secondly, I would like to take a moment to point out how much fun Geiger counters can be as a hobby. They are like metal detecting, if you like. Treasure hunting? You can find so many interesting things. Just be careful not to find things that are too interesting, if you know what I mean. You don't want things that, that, that have a thousand counts per minute and you can't stop them. Simple things, like this little piece of Vaseline glass, are quite safe. Do not keep it where there are children. Do not eat off of it. Wash your hands after you touch it or use it. And if it's, if it's a piece of Vaseline glass or depression glass, put it where there's a black light. It looks really neat. Notice there's very little radiation, unless you get really close. Then the Geiger counter goes crazy. This is because this is an alpha producer. So some pieces of, of material can be safely kept. This contains uranium oxide, if you're curious. 
That's why it's radioactive. It produces alpha and gamma, which I'll go into in subsequent, in subsequent videos. Anyhow, this has been Tom from anti-proton.com. Please let me know if you are interested in any more information. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. I'm perfectly willing to make a video just to answer your question. I enjoy it. But until then, this is Tom from anti-proton.com. Bye-bye.